I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. You graduate with this economics degree. You go from strip club DJ to Uber driver to stand-up comedy, what gave you the kind of ability to say, nope, I'm not going to do what my parents want me to do? I think it's fear and desperation. What were you afraid of? I mean, just picturing myself sitting behind a desk until I was 65. A lot of people say, okay, I'll do this for a few years while I pursue another dream. Right. You didn't do that. I just, I couldn't. I couldn't. After two months at this internship, I literally want to kill myself. I can't do it. Physically, it was impossible. What veered you into comedy? Look, it... It takes a lot of desperation, especially for me who never really grew up with stand-up. I wasn't like, oh, I saw Eddie Murphy on stage. I need to do stand-up at some point. It wasn't that. It was just like, well, fuck, what am I doing in my life? Nothing. So Googling local open mics is the last step before you Google what's the best way to kill myself. So I did that. I Google local open mics. I wasn't that funny, but I think I found a community pretty immediately of comedians who are bumbling around just like me. There was a sense of purpose there. You know, if you get good at this, there might be a future at something. So uh, I've got Jimmy Yang in the house today. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So two, two credits I want to mention, but there's many, of course. One is you're one of the main stars of my favorite or one of my favorite TV shows, top five TV uh-huh. show for me, Silicon Valley uh, on HBO. Uh, it's a great show. You're going into, what is it, the fourth season? I fifth season. We just finished season. shooting the fifth one, yeah. And um, and then also just out, and I just read it, How to American by Jimmy Yang. Thank you so much. And just to mention, on on Silicon Valley, you play Gene Yang. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So And people would be probably not surprised but your voice is obviously, but you're the only person whose voice is probably very different from the show as it is in real life. A lot of people come up to me, like say they're a fan of the show and they're surprised and they're like, oh my God, you actually speak English and they get surprised, which at first I thought it was kind of an insult. And I'm like, well, maybe I should take it as a compliment for acting, you know? But it's interesting because nobody's ever say one up to Johnny Depp and it was like, I, I, I didn't know you weren't actually a pirate, you know? So, it, <laughs> well, I guess then, okay, so why do you think that is? Because obviously, the Asian he's not a pirate. thing, or maybe it's maybe because I'm Asian, maybe I'm a better actor than Johnny Depp. Who knows? I don't know. I'm, I, the jury's out. And also, you're the only one on the show yeah. whose voice is different. In yeah, yeah, life. who plays more of a character than just myself. Yeah. I mean, when you first came on the show, I mean, even from this book, mm-hmm. it was unclear how much. At first, you really were "quote unquote" just a character. You were like yeah. this, this. I had two lines. Yeah, you uh, you were you were this odd person that T.J. Miller, who played Ehrlich Bachman, was incubating in his incubator along with the main cast. Yeah, and then 
you were just so hilarious. You became part of the main cast. Yeah, I was really fortunate, and you know that was my big break. Before that, I was like driving to Uber, you know. So I kind of snuck in on the show. Like it started off two lines, and then it gave me another two lines with the "I eat the fish" scene. And I think we saw there's some really fun dynamic with me and TJ. And then in the off season between season one and two, we didn't know if first of all Silicon Valley is going to come back, and second of all if my character is going to come back because I was just a guest star. I got paid nine hundred dollars a day, you know. And um, and then I got an offer to do a Yahoo series because Yahoo was going into original program as one of their first ever shows, and I got like a series regular part. But the thing was. Each HBO and Yahoo need an exclusivity, so I can either do one or the other. So I'm like, oh my god, I would love to be a series regular for the first time in my life on Yahoo, but I can't just not do this HBO show if it comes back. So it was like one of the most nerve wracking like morning in my in my life. I was waiting for my agent's call, and then I was drinking at the farmers market at the Grove in LA at like 11 a.m. You know, drinking what? Drinking beer. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like alcoholic beverages at eleven a.m. at a with, farmers market. Yeah, I didn't with, even know they had with a bunch served. of local drunks. You know, <laughs> yeah, at a farmers market. There's one bar in there, and um, yeah, and then finally I got the call from the from my agent. She she was like, yeah, we're gonna see if HBO can match the offer to make you a series regular. And I'm like, you're crazy. They're never gonna do that. And uh, and then they did, and here I am. So you know, because obviously. I don't even know what happened to that Yahoo. I don't even know what happened to Yahoo Originals in general. I think that just was an idea, a flash in the pan, yeah. and disappeared. They had two shows uh, called um, Other Space. That was a Paul Feig show. I heard it's very funny, but just nobody watched it because nobody who has a Yahoo app, right? And then the other show that I was going to do was called um, Sin City Saints, about a, like an expansion basketball team. I, I loved that idea, by the way. You mentioned it in the book. I thought that was a brilliant idea, the idea of having like this basketball team yeah. in Las Vegas and the stories behind it, I, I assume. Um, you almost think like an idea like that could succeed on a Netflix or an Amazon or something like that. Yeah, but everything is just such a crapshoot now. Like I'm so lucky the first show that I'm a series regular on became like a hit because so many, like you hear stories where George Clooney got like 17 pilots that never aired or something like that. And it's so many comics that's been around forever that's super funny. And they get on shows, good shows, and they never make it past the first season. Well, this kind of, you know, I want to get into the Silicon Valley stuff, your career, uh, the book, and everything. Um, but I'm curious what your what your thoughts are on on TV in general. Because like you said, there's so many new shows out there. It's not like there's three channels anymore and then HBO. Mm-hmm. Um Netflix has like is going to spend eleven billion on original content. Crazy. Amazon's going to spend ten billion. And while that seems like a great thing for actors, writers, directors, producers, it could be a bad thing too. In that kind of the day of five season shows is going to be over because they're just going to keep pouring money. They're going to just eliminate last year's everything except the top, yeah, and just make new shows. And there's no more syndication. Netflix is not syndicating to right. TBS. Um, so media has turned upside down. Like we had one really well-known guy on who had a show on uh, Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu. Wow. And I can guarantee you, I'll name all, if I named all three, you would not have heard of two of them. Right. Even though everybody on all three shows is a big name. Yeah. It, it, it's good and bad, right? Because I think back in the day when you have like four network channels, when you when you're on a show, you've made it like yeah. big time because everybody's watching you. Now the eyebrow balls are like more spread out, but at least these people have a job. At least people that's working on a Hulu show that you never heard of is getting paid a, a salary. You know what I mean? So, so it's good I guess and bad. That's true. So, yeah. like, let's say there's five thousand working comedians, then another hundred thousand working actors. Yeah, you know, at least now they have a chance for a year, two years to make a salary, have a chance to stand out and, and break out. Yes. Um, yeah. Whereas before they might not have. Yeah. Whereas before we just it was struggling driving Uber. Well, let, let's talk about first, that for a second because you were used the word struggle. <laughs> it's like your most interesting IMDb credit is you're in a film about driving Uber. Oh, yeah. Well, that was a short film me and my buddy did. There's actually this upcoming film. Um, uh, I, I didn't end up uh, getting the part, but it, it's about it's, it's called Stuber that they're developing a Sony. It's about an Uber driver that gets into some trouble. So I think that's becoming more and more mainstream. And uh, I'm not ashamed of driving Uber. It was fun when it lasted. Why should you be? I guess you make your own hours. Did you make? Yeah. Did you make money? How much money did you make a week at an Uber? 
it was that was when you can make a little more money. Now Uber's so cheap now, so it's hard, right? Because back in the day, I think I made like maybe it's podcast sponsored by Uber, <laughs> twenty five dollars an hour or something back in the day, which wasn't bad. And I drove a Prius. I did that actually between season one and two of Silicon Valley. I used whatever three thousand dollars to pay me from season one to like put in as a down payment on a used Prius. And that's how I survived for a little longer. So how much did you make per day as 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 an Uber driver? How much can I make per day? Yeah, I don't know, like two hundred bucks, three hundred bucks, and if it's Halloween or New Year's Eve, you can make like you know six hundred dollars. And what was the craziest Uber experience you had? You know, people ask me that, and oh, there's so I'm not, not original. Are you saying I'm not original? No, no, you're <laughs> fine. You're fine. It just I I I'm saying this is a me problem. I don't really have a great answer for that. It's nothing nuts. There's like drunk people. And like really self entitled uh, club goers, those are horrible people, you know. So uh, I lost a little faith in humanity afterwards. Okay, but why? Nothing what, what, nuts. What, what was like an example from a club goer? Considering you were a strip club DJ, yes. DJ, yeah. What did you see it from the kind of night, you know, the the club hopping, drunk Uber yeah. experience that really made you lose faith in humanity after being a strip club DJ? Like being a strip, there's, I've seen a lot, right? Being a strip club DJ, it was at a really seedy uh, strip club too in San Diego. And I've seen a lot of interacted with, with, with those girls. I've interacted with, you know, the gangsters that own the place, that ran the place. But they're, at the end of the day, they're kind of genuine people. You know, they just end up in this situation. And I always empathize with that. But uh, these club goers, sometimes they don't even treat the Uber driver like a human being. And, and that's the issue with it. Like what was know? an example? Like, like people just leaving drinks and like open bottles everywhere. They, they make you wait like 15 minutes. And, and I think Uber has done some things to, you know, make it better. I used to actually wish people would throw up in my car because I had a shitty old car. Old Prius, like a 2006 Prius. So if they threw up in my car, Uber would pay me like a $300 cleaning fee. So I was wishing people would throw up in my car, but that never happened. <laughs> so, okay, so you're, you're in between season one and season two of Silicon Valley. You were making $900 a day doing like a couple lines the here and there. actor minimum, yep. And, and you get this opportunity at, at Yahoo, which it would be unclear whether is this going to be a Netflix or is this going to be nothing. Yeah. But HBO has such cachet. Yeah. And by the way, Silicon Valley, even after season one, I think there was this great sense. There was already was some buzz. Be, yep. Yeah. And, and uh, it's Mike Judge. Uh, yeah, it's Mike Judge, Alec Berg, uh-huh. uh, who was you know not only curb your enthusiasm but Seinfeld. Seinfeld. You know, so there's this rich history in 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 Silicon Valley, and also you get this sense with HBO that they've mastered the kind of entourage concept. Like, let's take a real world environment and. Throw some superstars in it and right. see what happens. So they did it with Entourage in Hollywood. I feel Silicon Valley was their version of doing that in a funny Mike Judge sort of way yeah. in Silicon Valley. And really, they have an all-star comedy team. I mean, those main five guys, and then you had first season you had Christopher Evan Welch. You know, of course, Amanda Crew and everyone. Matt Ross, amazing actors. You know, I think Alec sent a recent interview. It's like we got a deep bench. You know, and then when I came in, I came off the bench. You know, I was able to hit some threes. So like it, it just kind of worked out, you know. No, but- I mean right from the beginning, you were funny, and so I would say it's different than from the beginning. We see T.J. Miller is playing almost this comedic role. You're mm-hmm. playing more of a character that's extremely funny, but you evolved obviously yeah. into to having depth and and you know being consistently you know having a um, motivation that was consistently exactly. funny like the other yeah. actors so so you grew into the into the role but i mean did you get the sense that this was somehow special that's why you wanted to do keep on doing silicon valley i mean first of all mike judge was my commencement speaker in my college uh, at ucsd yeah at ucsd he he was talking about he was a physics major and then he didn't like that so he ended up eventually finding his passion in animation which spoke to me at the time because i was an economics major and i had, i wanted nothing to do with that i didn't want to go who, into finance who ever does like who right? in your class Became an economist. <laughs> it's who or finance. Like nobody goes into it because they love it. Right. Like you love money, maybe, right? So I, I, I didn't want to do that, and I was kind of lost. And then eventually, I found stand up. So that speech, like, kind of really spoke to me. But let and, me ask you about that. Yeah. So Mike Judge, you know, first off, did obviously he did Office Space, uh-huh. um, but really, like, what inspired me most with Mike Judge was back in the day, Beavis and Butthead was just brilliant. Yep. And it's not even sophisticated 
comedy. It's not like he's making. I think deep down it is. You can see the sophistication, but on the surface, it's like two bumbling idiots, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the humor is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The actual drawings and the the, the the his budget for animation was probably not very high at <laughs> well, that time. Well, that's just yeah, his right hand, yeah. basically. And and <laughs> it's funny. And uh, uh, but it was brilliant in terms of like everybody in the country started talking like Beavis and Butthead mm-hmm. at, at once that show started airing. So he had this like r- really great comedic sense. Do you think what what veered you into comedy? Mm. Uh, you know, was it in part Mike Judge kind of showing, hey, anything's possible? Or could it see even in the book, suddenly you're going up for stand up comedy. Right. It was a little unclear what the bridge was. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad you asked it. I think it's growing up, I was the youngest in the family. Well, I've an older brother. And whenever there was like uh, any type of argument or disagreement, I have to be the funny one to kind of diffuse the situation. Mm. And also coming here from Hong Kong when I was 13, not even like knowing the language very well, I have to. I can't fight, you know, I'm little. So like I have to use humor to kind of deflect and defend myself. And when people like start talking shit, I have to come up with some comebacks. So I think that's when I developed a sense of humor. Um, instead of, you know, uh, fighting, you know, I, I was able to joke my way around a lot of situations. So I think stand-up comedy when I, because I tried a bunch of different things when I told you I didn't want to do financial economics. I tried jujitsu, I tried boxing, I tried whatever. Honestly, I was horrible at those two things, obviously. Wait, what, and then but, stand-up but, spoke to me. Did you try, I mean, I read about you trying jujitsu and it was funny in the book. Yeah. The, the book, by the way, I just want—I'm going to recommend it over and over. But thank you. Your 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 stories in the book are hilarious. It's a it's a, it's a great book. Uh, I'll comment more about it later. But I didn't get the sense you're trying jujitsu as a career in the book. I was so lost. I just wanted to find a community of anything. It might not have been I not maybe not being a UFC fighter, but maybe a jujitsu instructor or finding somebody there, uh, a community there that would hook me up with a job at somewhere else. You know, I was just lost. I needed to find like new people that I can hang out with, or else my life seemed like a dead end to me. Even right after I graduated college, it was very scary. I was like twenty two, but my life, I was like either I'm gonna go into finance and sit behind a desk forever, or I'm just gonna meander around forever. Like I had no idea what. The hell I wanted to do. And what were your uh, like best college friends doing? Uh, one of them was an engineering major, and then someone went to grad school. Someone was pre med, went to medical school. A lot of them continued just working. And then one of my best friends from high school, he just started working construction for his family. So it's either family business that they fell into because they needed a job, or you continue. They continued the education, but not any of them i don't think ended up you know pursuing their passion especially not right after college but but what's interesting though is and this is a conflict that goes throughout your throughout the book and throughout your story is it sounds like all your best friends were pursuing things their parents would still love right <laughs> would still love them for their job and you mentioned how it's like you know family money and forget Passions. Right, that's it's the like very the rules Chinese of, foreign culture. Yeah. yeah, it's you make money, be safe. Because my dad came from a place like he had to live through the communist revolution when he was young, so he didn't even get the chance to go to a university, even though he wanted to, and he was very smart. So he wanted nothing but the best for me. He wanted me to go to university and like find a safe job because I have the opportunity now that they have given me. And I still don't want to do that. So you can see how disappointed he would be, and I understand that. But you know, in the book, I wrote like I felt like I had to disappoint my parents for a few years instead of disappointing myself for the rest that, of my that's life. That's a hard thing because again, all your friends are not disappointing their parents. Probably, mm-hmm. maybe a lot of other Asian Americans that you knew that were your age were not disappointing their their right. parents. What gave you kind of the 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 few neurons that sw- uh-huh. went on instead of off, what gave you the kind of ability to say, nope, I'm not going to do what my parents want me to do? I, I, I don't think it's like confidence or that. I think it's fear and desperation. Just, what were you afraid of? I mean, just picturing myself sitting behind a desk until I was 65. On That's the really same mature job. to project that far out into the future at that age. Like a lot of people say, okay, I'll do this for a few years while I pursue another dream. Right. You know, you didn't do that. I just, I couldn't. I couldn't. After like two months at this internship, like I literally want to kill myself. Like, can't do it. You know, 
Like physically, it was impossible. For that me. was the Smith Barney. Yeah, internship? Smith Barney. It was a very prestigious financial firm. It's an internship that my dad hooked me up with, and I just they even offered me a job, and I just couldn't do it. So I think part of it it's got to be a, a genetic makeup where maybe I'm more risk taking, and literally I, I wouldn't allow myself to do something like that. I just couldn't do it. Was it a rebellion? I don't know if it's a re- maybe it's a quiet rebellion. I didn't do it on purpose. Maybe subconscious. But a lot of it, I think it's a desperation of like, I wasn't really getting laid either. So like I needed to go get laid somehow, like sitting behind a desk ain't gonna help me. So right, so let's let's analyze this because it's very interesting. So sitting behind a desk, you're thinking to yourself, okay, there's 6,000 or, or a million other people in the surrounding 20 miles that are sitting behind desks. Yes. And all of them, either make more money than me yep. or in, in your mind, you think they have some other status over me that I'm not going to achieve for several years at least until I'm like made partner or make more money sure. or whatever. Yeah. And you figured, okay, I had built up this force field of comedy to defend myself growing up in school. Yeah. You know, Maybe you were insulting the bullies back or having the bullies lay off of you because you were funny so they thought you were right. cool or whatever. So you figured you had this skill you didn't know what it was but you figured at the very least it could potentially be a status enough skill that if you worked harder at it you would meet a girl maybe i'm bra- i'm being I, I, a I psychoanalyst think... if i charge no no uh, $600 yeah. an hour. No, that's not a bad analysis i mean it's pretty on point and i think a lot of stand-ups feel that way and and a lot of us we do what we do is because we are not content with what we already have. I mean, if, if you look at people, I got friends that, you know, uh, say grew up in Ohio and they got married when they're 18 and they have three kids by the time they're 20. Very content. I wish I could be more like that, right? But I can't. I just, I, I don't know why, but it just, I'm not, I wanted to live life and I get antsy and I panic when I'm not constantly doing stuff. So uh, do you think that's because and this is not judgmental on, I mean, I also often wish, boy, why couldn't I be one of those, you know, uh, right now, just to mention to the listeners, this is the first time I'm doing a podcast. We're on the stage at Stand Up New York, which is a club that I, it's a comedy club I uh, partially own. And often, and I'm just mentioning too, often uh, uh, in the audience here, when I'm on stage, I'll ask them, how long have you been together? A couple. Yeah. Sometimes there's these couples that have been together 25 years and I'll say, well, have you ever had any major difficulties? And they'll look at each other and like, no, no, not really. And so I wonder about this. And I and I wonder if just some people are not, and this is not judgmental, but some mm-hmm. people are just not so complex and they're just happy being regular. And- I wish I'm more like that. And and I don't know if it's not complex. And if if you want to really go like Dr. Drew on this, you know, which I listened to like growing up on uh, Love Dr. Line. Dr. Drew, is a, uh, Dr. Drew uh, wrote a blurb. Yeah, he's he great. wrote a blurb on the back of your book. He, he's, he's a friend. He's awesome. So I always, you know, think about stuff in that kind of Love Line analysis sense. Maybe I grew up around a little more chaos because of the immigration, because of my family maybe. That's why I'm used to a more unstable, you know, risk-taking life. Maybe it's genetics. Or maybe those people that you say are possibly less complex and more comfortable, they grew up in a, you know, they're used to a more calming environment back home. So they can just go out and be happy and find a family when they're 18 and settle down. Yeah, so it could be like the the immigration was obviously a big upheaval in Jolt, your life. Jolt, turning stuff upside down. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and Trauma usually people narrowly define, but if you broadly define it as like a jolt like that, it was clear, it was a traumatic event moving from a, a one country where to another country where you didn't really speak the language. Right, <laughs> that's traumatic at at the age of thirteen, which is yeah the the age for the rest of your life you're going to identify your your id with is yeah. going to be thir- you're always that thirteen year old boy who's you kind of stuck in that age, yeah. And mm-hmm. I, I never went going through it. I never thought it was traumatic. I still don't think it's traumatic. I think it's what made me who I am. Whatever that m- might be, you know. So sure, traumatic doesn't I, have I, to I, be bad. I, yeah, right, right. I was. I'm, I'm just saying. Like, I never looked at it as like I'm a victim. Why did this have to happen to me? I don't think that's positive at all. And uh, you know, um, um, but it, but then, then then there was the the bullies. Then there's mm-hmm. the the fact that uh, these jobs seemed horribly boring to you. Yeah. So at some point, you said, "Okay, I'm I'm funny. I'm gonna. I I want to meet a girl. I need some. It's all part of this calculation of how can I get higher status in my life given the 
uh, variables that already exist. I think that maybe that's always in the back of my mind. I want this. How do I get that? Right. I think that's everybody has that mechanism, but it wasn't a very conscious decision. I was seriously just like bumbling around trying to find something that will make me feel a little better about myself and to find a new f- group of friends. Right. You know. Um, but yeah, it was it was more in the back of my mind. It was it wasn't like okay. I want to get girls. So I want to go go do stand up and do this. That was part of it, but it was never because of that necessarily. You know. And so so you so what happened? Like, how did you? What 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 was the first stand up experience like? I, I I signed up for an open mic. Well, I googled local open mics, and I think that was like ChuckleMonkey dot com. That I think is still around. Um, and one of the most consistent open mic I could find at an actual comedy club was the Haha ha Comedy Club in North Hollywood. You got to pay five dollars for five minutes of open mics in front of five pissed off comics that's waiting for their own turn. So yeah, I googled it, and then I was look. It it takes a lot of desperation, especially for me who never really grew up with stand up. I wasn't like, oh, I saw Eddie Murphy on stage. I need to do stand up at some point. It wasn't that. It was just like, well, fuck. What am I doing in my life? Nothing. So it's. <laughs> I was like in the book. I think I said like um, googling local open mics. Is the last step before you Google what's the best way to kill myself? Right. So I did that. I Google local open mics and I went to Haha ha Comedy Club, and uh, it was fun. I wasn't that funny, but I think I found a community like pretty immediately of just these comedians who are bumbling around just like me, these open micers. But there was a sense of purpose there. You know, if you get good at this, there might be a future at something. So did you? Start how how regularly were you were you doing these? Open I started mics? doing it every day, every single day, seven days a week. They have an open mic right before the regular show, so I had nothing better to do. I was just playing video games at my dad's house, so I, I just went up every day. That was during the summer, uh, junior year, I think, uh, when I was in college. So I still had to go back to San Diego, and when I went back to San Diego, that's when I really kind of polished my act. I got a job at the Comedy Palace down there, and uh, really got some state real stage time. What does it mean, polish your act? Just, um, I guess, doing open mics, polishing my act too. But you know, building my act, building from a five-minute open mic set where you have maybe one good bit to a f- solid five minutes to ten minutes to fifteen minutes, right? And then I think I spent maybe a year and a half in San Diego doing that, uh, and then I got pretty regular stage time on real shows on the weekends, even on showcases, which is, I guess, pretty rare, especially for an LA comedian to get in, you know. A year, but luckily I was in San Diego, so there's less competition, more stage time, in a way, or less competition for the stage time. And uh, eventually, I got fairly good. I think I got like a really solid twenty minutes um, that people are like really starting to respond to. Looking back, some of the stuff was hack. You know, I was like a year, two years in. Of course, it was hack, but I was comfortable on stage. You know, I, I developed enough where I was getting laughs, and that's when I moved back to LA. Well, because of other circumstances too, because the strip club DJ job I had also got a little too dangerous, so I had to move to LA. That forced it, it, me to go to LA. In one interview, you basically say, and it's kind of a, the funniest thing. You basically say at some point you had a fork in the road about whether to continue as a yeah. strip club DJ or you know move to LA. I don't think many people have that kind of fork in the road in their lives. Like, yeah, you know, uh, it maybe wasn't... maybe describe a little uh, just. What was the strip club DJing like? So I think when you're 22, working in a strip club is like a lot of kids' dreams. You know what I mean? Like it's awesome, right? Like you, you think you're gonna go like have sex with like cool strippers, hang out with like cool gangster people. At least I thought that was cool. But really, you soon realized it was a really seedy strip club. Also, it's not like a nice like whatever Spearman Rhino or anything. It's a really seedy club ran by like this gangster. Um, but he was always really nice to me. He's always, you know, uh, taken a liking to me. And um, it was, you soon realized none of these people that worked there wanted to work there. I was the only idiot that wanted to work there. Those people have been in prison and that they have no choice but to work there, right? Who, who's, who's they? Like, who are the. Okay, so uh, the bouncer, his name, I, ch- I changed the name in the book, but in the book, his name is Beast because he looked like a beast. Like, honestly, like, um, and his real name's not too far from that. And these are all nicknames they earn in prison. And he was in the Aryan Brotherhood in prison. I'm sure he didn't like me working there, you know. And then there's a bar shift manager named Chef. Uh, the 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 owner's name was Shooter. And they're just 
actual people that went to prison, not just jail, but like prison, like gangsters and um, all the strippers. Like I was, I was really nice with the strippers. I, you know, I'm not an asshole like to anyone really. So I was bring, trying to bring professionalism into a strip club, which was great for like the business, right? But then I started getting like friend zoned by the strippers. Like I was too nice. I couldn't even get laid with the strippers. They would literally sit in the DJ booth naked next to me, telling me prob- about problems with their boyfriends. And I'm like, this is the most miserable thing ever. I'm like trying to cross my legs, hiding my boner with this like beautiful naked woman next to me. And I have to listen to her boyfriend. Like, are you, are you kidding me? And then eventually it got like kind of crazy because uh, Shooter really liked me. And um, he was like, oh, Hey kid, you know, strip club, uh, I mean the um, lap dance sales went up 44% the first week you were here. I didn't know he was keeping numbers like that. But I guess the thing was, I was pretty good on the microphone already because I had training as a stand-up and I was pretty good as a salesman because I was selling used cars also back in San Diego. So I combined the two skills and I became like a pretty good like lap dance salesman, right? And um, yeah, he really liked me and he offered, he was like, I just came into some money. And uh, I want to open up a strip club for you to run. So think about it. Let me know. Which it's not an easy decision, especially for someone who, like me, who thinks that kind of stuff is cool. And also, like twenty-two or twenty-three, uh, you're showing aptitude, and uh, potentially you can make who knows three, four, five hundred thousand a year running one of these clubs. Yeah, exactly. And sitting next to naked women, you know, uh, which, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, because I think combining the skills, it, it's it's you, w- w- when you're a strip club DJ, your job is first of all to keep the girls on time, make sure they get on stage. So I was nice to them, so they had no problem doing that. And your main job is to sell lap dances. You want everybody like that's sitting in the uh, regular area go into the VIP. So I'll basically high pressure sales them, but I know how to talk on the microphone. Because I'm a stand-up, so I was able to combine the two. Like, uh, so, so you were able to combine kind of the sales techniques of used car salesman with, let's say, kind of the audience control you learned. Exactly, with I can reach the stand-up. crowd. Like, right. all right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, two for one lap dance going on right now. Get get two girls for the price of one in the same room, or get two lap dances for the price of one. Don't don't be shy with your wallet. Don't be tight. And then I would literally do crowd work and point people out. You gentlemen over there with a the nice polo shirt. I see Jade is looking over you. You know, you should get two lap dances with her for the price of one right now. And then I would seriously just like high pressure sales them. And it will kind of work. That's so funny. So, 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 okay, fork in the road. How did I sell a car? I brought strippers to car lot. No, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> so, 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 okay, fork in the road. How did you decide? It actually, something kind of happened uh, where I had to spend Christmas at the strip club. I worked on Christmas Day on the strip club. That was just so miserable in itself. And then we closed early because fortunately, there weren't a lot of customers in there that night. And then these two drunk college kids came in. They were like, oh, hey, man, and on your Yelp page, it says you guys close at 2. Like, what's up? It's 12 o'clock. We want to see some titties, you know? And I'm like, uh, no, we're closed. And then Beast, the bouncer, was like, yeah, just leave. We're closed. He was like, man, that's not cool. That's not fair. So then they left, but they were still like talking shit outside of the club, like cussing us out. And then Beast would, just wouldn't have it. And then he went up to Chef, the bar manager, like, all right, let's go. And then they went outside. Chef grabbed like a two by four table leg that he had ready as a weapon. And then I follow him outside. The next thing I know, like, you know, Beast got the dude in a chokehold and like Chef was like beating them in the ribs. And and that picture in itself was like a j- j- just like an alert for me, you know, because I was the age I should be in those college students' shoes because I was their age, you know. I want to party, I want to hang out. I was them, but I have crossed over to the other side. I'm now the employee of this gangster side, and I could have totally went to jail that night, you know. And then the next day, I remember I was at the comedy club, like bragging to my buddies. I'm like, dude, like yesterday, man, it was fucking cool, dude. We beat up these two kids, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and then my buddy, who's, uh, who's always been a mentor of mine, uh, Sean Kelly, he's a comedian in San Diego, um, who eventually made it as a reality show star in England. Great, great guy, really smart guy. And he called me, he was like, dude, like I heard you telling those stories at the comedy club. It's not cool. You're a funny dude. You need to get the fuck out of there as soon as possible. And moved to LA and and try to make it as a stand up, and and I did. You know, I quit like the next day, and I moved to LA. I think the next week. Mm-hmm. 
So you arrive in LA. Uh, you, I guess you start doing stand up there, but you're also starting to go on auditions. Mm-hmm. Um, what was what was what? Were, I mean, obviously you must have had a lot of rejection. But the first question I have is, what did you see as the difference between your experiences doing stand up in LA versus San Diego? Because now there's much more competition for stage time. Yeah, uh, LA. It's it's like turning on your Netflix when you do stand up in LA. It's unfocused. There's so many venues people got so much to do and you have to compete with stage time with Chris Rock popping in like how how do you do that so I was struggling to get stage time just like everybody else but at least I grinded out my material so at least if I did get the stage time I was able to be funny where San Diego it's a smaller community not everybody's trying to get on TV I mean maybe they are in the back of their minds but you know we're just having fun and it's cool it's like more like a fraternity whereas here it's more like I mean not here in New York but in LA it's more like a business um and so I was struggling and I needed to just make ends meet at first because I rented out this dude's apartment for like $300, his living room. And I needed to come up with the rent. I needed to eat. You know, I didn't want to go back to living with my dad and be a complete failure. So um, I wanted a couple of my buddies at the comedy store told me like, dude, go get on some commercials. They're easy acting. You, maybe just a reaction. You don't have any lines. And one dude like did a vodka commercial that got paid like 60 grand in residuals and the other dude, like you know that's like a lottery ticket that I I was like oh shit so this is great all I need is one commercial a year and I can do it it sounds doable but it's like how do you find an agent in the first place like nobody knows who you are so I went on like all the casting sites you know LA casting whatever casting frontier actors access signed up paid all the money because you got it's a fucking racket you got to pay 35 bucks to upload a headshot you know and then uh uh uh, like twenty two dollars per minute to upload like a reel or video. I didn't have any reel. I have like a shitty headshot that my friend took for me, and I don't have any acting reel. So I just put my stand up in as my reel, and on the bottom in the comment box, I just wrote, "New in town, good comedic timing, looking for representation." And luckily, I got like two calls maybe from like really really small agencies uh, in a couple of months. The first one, the agency was in an apartment rental office and he had me read like a Staples commercial, like a size, like Staples, where like blah, blah, blah. And I was so bad, I was rejected by that agency that was in an apartment rental office. How, how, I remember reading about that, but describe how, how were you bad at reading a Staples commercial? I didn't even know what an audition was. Like they were like slate your name. I'm like, what the fuck is that? Right? Really, that just means say your name. I'm like, why didn't you just tell me that? Just tell me, say my name. Why, why do you have to say Slate? What is that? So it's like, I just looked like a rookie that was very nervous. I was, it's nerves. You know, I don't think you can really fuck up a Staples commercial, but it just nerves and, and you, you're not even acting like a human being at that point. Um, yeah. And then eventually I found my agent, uh, Jane, who was uh, in a small agency and she took me to kind of, yeah, she sent me out to all these auditions. I, I think one of my favorite part of the book is um, this audition log I kept. It yeah. is 101 auditions. All of the 101 auditions that led up to my 102nd audition, which was Silicon Valley. And, and you know, I talk to a lot of different actors and actresses and rejection is basically a part of it. And the ones who survive have been rejected, you know, 101 times mm-hmm. or more. And how do you, uh, you know, What's the mentality you have to get to sort of survive all this rejection? Is it partly yeah. community? I think, yeah, like acting classes, seeing, sharing the other people's struggles. Like, Were you taking uh, acting classes? I was. I was spending like $600 in acting classes every month when my rent was only $300, you know? And um, like every penny I made, like I put it into acting classes. Were they useful? What were you learning? Absolutely. There? I mean, just, I took a class that was literally just like audition skills. Huh. They don't. They don't teach that in acting school, but that was very important. You know, it's a different. It's a different sport than stand up. It's a different audition. Is a different sport than acting in a way. And eventually, you know, I got better, and 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 you know, I found my own voice. It's like finding your own voice in stand up. You got to find your own voice, who you are, in acting. You know, and be truthful. I think that's the main thing that I learned. Um, and that just takes time. It takes acting classes. It takes time of you finding yourself also. Um, and once that clicked, it became better and I became more confident. But yeah, the rejection part, that never goes away. I still go to a lot of auditions that I get rejected for and you still get pissed, but it's like, 
but but that's just the nature of the business and i i still have it better i think than 99 percent of the people out there you know well and particularly particularly now you know post silicon valley i'm yeah. sure a lot of people are now the calls are incoming people yeah. want to say we want someone like you yeah. know jimmy yang to play this role it's great i mean yeah hopefully silicon valley would go i don't know how many more seasons but we're just done with the fifth one and um yeah especially since my role has expanded um it's a great show because the industry watches it people like you people like casting directors uh movie studio uh, producers whatever they watch that show so they they start to know who i am but eh, a part of it gets lost in translations um because they think i am that guy some people even the industry people so i have to prove to them like i'm I, i'm actually more than just that character you know i'm a different person what what kind of uh, role would you like to play outside? Of, obviously, you like to play the Silicon Valley role, but yeah. outside of that, what would you like to play? Well, I think Patriot's Day was a very re- rewarding role. Uh, I played a based on real life, also Chinese immigrant, but it was based on a real life guy in a drama. It was very serious, recounting the Boston Marathon bombing, and like it was Mark Wahlberg, J.K. Simmons, like yeah. like the gods of like acting, you know. And it was really really rewarding. It was tough. So I want to do more of that. Not necessarily just Chinese immigrant roles, although I do love those roles, uh, especially when they have a lot of meat and a lot of dimension to them. Um, but just something maybe like a drama, like like um, something that's more based on real life and uh, more meaningful than just being funny. I mean, I love being funny. It's great. But Well, you know, I mean, I've Silicon Valley is an interesting show because obviously there's a couple of things interesting, I think. Obviously, it's a sitcom, but almost all the actors are... Either hardcore stand-up comedians mm-hmm. like T.J. Miller was up until this. You know, he's not in the next season, but up until this, he's a yeah, yeah. His background is also stand-up comedian. You have Martin Starr, who's been doing comedic acting since Freaks and Geeks. Yeah, um, who's just brilliant. Um, Kamal obviously is yeah. uh, you know stand-up. Uh, so it's, there's like more, and HBO seems good at this. Put throw a lot of stand-up comedians in the show. This dates back all the way to the yeah. the Larry Sanders show. Put a bunch of stand-up comedians in the show, let them go, yeah, and they're going to be better than regular actors. I don't know if that's true or not. Like, there's a difference between actors and like you could see the difference, you know, on many shows where even shows that are about comedy or sitcoms, if you don't have stand-ups in the show, they're they're missing some comedic element. And I think Silicon yeah. Valley, there's is there a lot of improv in the show? There is a lot, and they're great improvisers. Some of the best in the world, like Zach Woods and uh, Thomas, right, and Kumail, and all all those guys. But I, I think um, they're also very good actors beyond just being good stand up. Stand up was like their training, but they also became good actors. And I think I can say that for all of us on the show. And a lot of times, stand ups don't know how to transition to acting, and I had trouble doing that when I was first auditioning because what's the hardest part? We don't listen. We don't listen. We listen to ourselves. We might be able to listen to the audience, but we don't know how to listen. We just run our mouths and, and do our material. But the most important thing in the acting and improv is to listen, mm. to play with the other person. A lot of stand-ups don't know how to play with the other person. they just thinking, how am I going to make this funny? How am I going to make this funny in their own head? So once you kind of let go, trust the other person and, and let them in and listen to them, pay attention to them, then it's it's I think that's when it clicks for a lot of stand-ups or did, actors in general. Did learning that ability translate into better stand-up skills as well? I think I think it made me a better person in general. I think to become a, a better actor, I literally I had to go to therapy because I was so like all my emotions were so blocked. Being like you know from a Chinese culture, we don't really talk about that stuff. So I had to kind of open up more as a person. Per- person, you know, I. I I cry every now and then now, like just in real life, I, just when I'm watching a movie, I cry during La La Land, you know? Whereas I used to never do that because, you know, we'd hold our emotions back. But that that allows you to be more truthful as a performer, as an actor. And so with, with Silicon Valley, again, I feel like there's this rich tradition from Seinfeld all the way up to Silicon Valley where you, there's all this talent. Mm-hmm. It's, it's comedic talent, it's directing talent, it's writing talent. Yeah. And it, this is almost like, the the next generation of the curb your enthusiasms and Seinfeld yeah and I hope and so when on. people look back because like say Seinfeld or um you know say The Wire when people look back to that show he's like yo these guys are like stars now like Michael B Jordan you know Idris Elba and all those guys like I hope people look back to Silicon Valley and be like oh my god this group of people 
like they were all on one show. That's unbelievable. You know what I mean? It was like um, the Oklahoma, uh, uh, the OKC Thunders, like uh, OKC Thunder and the NBA. They had Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, and James Harden on the same team. And now they're individually some of the best players in the league. So I hope people look back and be like, wow, that was something special. Yeah, or for HBO shows, you look at the Larry Sanders show. Mm-hmm. Everybody, I mean, Judd Apatow even was a writer on that show. Right. Or uh, Freaks and Geeks. Freaks and Geeks was amazing. Yeah. Oh, That's what was crazy. unbelievable, including Martin Starr was on Silicon Valley. Yeah, exactly. James so, Franco, all those guys. And uh, on Silicon Valley, every now and then you get a guest appearance from a real Silicon Valley yeah. person. Are those, uh, I mean, there is some intersection between the experience of Silicon Valley and real life. I mean, it is kind of a remnant of real life Silicon Valley stories. Like that is the experience of being in a startup. Yeah, I think the writers and consultants know that our audience is very picky. They would literally look at the code on a computer and go on Reddit and say that's bullshit, right? They'll call bullshit. So we do a ton of work, the writers and the consultants. And Dick Costello is our consultant last year, I think. Yeah, I saw him on one of the episodes. Yeah, yeah, he was the CEO of Twitter. and uh, He wrote the forward to one of my books. Oh, really? That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. I, I know Dick for a long time. That's great, and 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 I mean, because once you have people like that, then you, you get a really accurate depiction of, of of the valley and of the people. The only maybe negative thing, but really, it's a compliment that people from Silicon Valley have said to me. It's like I can't watch this show because it reminds me too much of my life and it stresses me out. Right, it is so. Stressful. Which is a if great you're from that background, compliment. it's yeah. a stressful show. Yeah. So just the uh, the angst about how financings fall through and oh God, yeah. acquisition deals fall through and the kind of high stakes million dollar decisions you have to make and you often make wrong decisions. Yeah, and, and I mean the writers do such a good job that it's relatable on a human level, like a failure, success, something right in front of you getting taken away. So it's not just people in Silicon Valley that will understand, you know, and I think that's what all good writing is. Now, now you in order to shoot, first off, when you finally made the decision to be a series regular, or, or when it was the decision, they was, made a decision. They, they made the decision yeah. was made for you. Yeah, you called up Yahoo, said no, going to go with HBO. Was yeah. the HBO? Did they offer you like a deal? It's going to be more than yeah. It was a like a six year deal. Uh, it wasn't like a lot of money, but I was just so happy. It was a massive raise from what I from nine hundred dollars a day, you mm-hmm. know. And to be a series regular, I mean, I I knew that day when I was sitting at that farmers market, like my life was going to change. It was uh, amazing. And then uh, I also read somewhere, I forget if it was in the book or an interview you did, that while you're shooting the series, you don't do stand-up um, or you don't do it as much. You basically oh. take a break from stand-up. Does that, do you miss it during those periods or like do you go right back to it when the show stops shooting? Uh, I don't think it's the show or not. I just haven't been doing too much stand-up lately. I'm, 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 I've recently found the juice again to do it. But one of the reasons why I wrote the book was because I kind of want to step away from stand-up a little bit. Why is that? Because... I kept doing the same shit and I wasn't writing too much, right? I feel like stand up, it's people, people like I had like ex girlfriends be like, you don't do anything all day. You just go on stage 10 minutes or whatever, an hour a night, and like, that's it. And I have to work hard and you don't do shit. I'm like, wait a minute. No, because I'm thinking all day. Like, people don't see that thinking process that goes through, right? Because they think you're just sitting on your couch playing video games. But I'm thinking about jokes, about bits, observing people. So I think stand up is a very, life encompassing job if you want to really be good at it you got to really look at the world a different way and I wasn't doing that I was just going on stage because somebody asked me to or I want to keep my act sharp or I'm doing a college to make some money but I was doing the same old shit that I didn't want to keep doing anymore it's not even truthful to me but you were you were thinking of new bits though Uh... but I didn't have the time when I'm Mm. shooting or like to think of new bits. So what I did, like that's why I want to write the book because there's so many stuff like um, the strip club DJ stuff that I never figure out how to make it into like a concise bit that can get a laugh every few seconds or like whatever, you know, that's more of like the setup punchline format. So I wrote it down long form that I've been telling my buddies and hopefully in the future I can now grab material from the book and turn that into more of a stand-up thing or even like a one-man show thing. Yeah, because the stories are humorous, but you mentioned also in an interview that stand-up is where you need to make a you know people laugh every, let's say, you say four seconds. There's but, an expectation, you know, every, yeah. Every some number of seconds. And the book, you don't have to, mm-hmm. or public speaking say you don't have to. Um, but it does seem like you can, you know, there's certainly a lot of premises you just said, like about, you know, working in a strip club that were funny. 
yeah. uh, you know, the naked girl sitting next to you, but you were friend zoned. Right. And there's some premises there that are that are you know funny. Right. But if I would have like like I think you were chuckling when I was telling you some of that stuff. But if I would have done that, I would have said the exact same thing in front of a stand up crowd where they had just saw say another stand up or expecting me to make them laugh. They might not laugh that hard. They might just chuckle, and that's kind of not okay in stand up, right? What What would be your approach if you were going to try to punch that up? I know it's a um, it's editing on demand challenge, but no, I mean for for me, it's stand up is all trial and error and editing, right? You start off rambling a story, and then you cut it down, you cut it down, and you you chisel away on that piece of marble until it's something, and it, you turn like a two minute bit into like thirty seconds of punchlines, and that's stand up. And a lot of people will like when they're new, they're like, "Oh yeah, I can do an hour." I'm like, "Yeah, but there's like maybe two minutes of good stuff in that hour. You know, you have five minutes of material. You don't have an hour. You can talk for an hour, but that's not stand up. You know." Um, so to me, I, I I don't know. And also, I want to explore some stuff that's more like <laughs> it's funny because I think stand ups are so cynical. Like uh, if somebody's really bombing on stage, we'll make fun of them. Like you know, in the back, it's like, "What is he doing? A fucking TED talk?" Right, but now I actually think TED talks are amazing, right? And 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 it moves people, it makes people think. So there is a time and place for that. Maybe not in a stand-up comedy club, but maybe in a one-man show format or something like that. I went to Edinburgh for the first time uh, this past year, and I was watching five shows a day, and they have stand-up one-man shows, hypnosis, plays, and that was really inspiring to know that not everything needs to be in a stand-up format where you, you're expecting. You know, a punchline every five seconds or whatever. So that was pretty liberating. And I might do a one man show. I don't know. Based on this book, you think? I I, I hope so. Um, and then now you're um, also in a few months, uh, or I don't know if you've shot it already, but you're coming out with Crazy Rich Asi- yeah. Asians, a movie. Yeah. Um, Whereas all Asian cast, basically. First studio movie in 25 years since Joy Luck Club with a, with a full Asian cast. That's amazing. Why do you think there hasn't been an all Asian cast movie since then? I mean, there's like all. Everything else, even there's an you know my big Greek wedding was an all Greek right. cast. Uh, I I honestly I don't, I don't know, and uh, I'm used to being on set as the only Asian person in every set, and and that was an amazing experience to just be an actor instead of an Asian actor in that movie because everybody's so talented, beautiful, and whatever. You just feel so proud to be Asian, right? And uh, hopefully, if this movie does well, that'll lead to more doors opening for movies like that. So is that where you see the career going is more acting and maybe more dramatic acting? I think for now. I mean, Crazy Rich Asian, I play a very comedic role. It's a romantic comedy, but it's it, it's an interesting thing. It takes you to this different, different world, and I think people will find it very interesting. It's a really good film. I saw a screening for it. Um, but yeah, I think just building characters, I really like that because I play this because Crazy Rich Asians is based on a book of the same name. And uh, the character I play is supposed to be the biggest asshole. He's supposed to be obese. And um, he's just really loud and obnoxious. And it's, I mean, Jing Yang's an asshole, but it's a different type of asshole. And just in person, you don't come across as you know, an obese, annoying person. You're, you're, <laughs> you're a thin, uh, But that's what's fun about person. it, right? Because so, I can't. So how did you get into role? Like, What was the pro- mental process of getting into that role? I think there's a part of me that really wants to be that person, but I I can't because I think there's part of us that always want to be certain. We we want to pull the guy out of the car to cut us off and beat his ass. Maybe it's just me, but I think all of us has a little part of that, and I just love letting that kind of stuff out because you can't you can't do it in real life. And but really building like a three dimensional character and and be kind of naked and and let that part out and be naked. So so. Uh... What I like about this book, so How to American by Jimmy Yang, what I like about it is that it shows anything is possible. You kind of graduate with this economics degree. You go from strip club DJ to Uber driver to stand-up comedy, starring in you know one of the best shows on television right now, to movies, to writing this book. And still, everything is open in front of you. And, and you kind of take, it's like you said before, you're able to take skills and combine them to build up new skills. And I think that's a very valuable lesson for people to learn. They don't have to stick to just learning one skill and improving that all their lives. You could be unique by combining all these skills yeah. to create your own set of unique, you know, Jimmy Yang skills. Right. And I, I think it's an inspirational story. I think people should get this book and uh, uh, 
give us some insight. What's going to happen on the next Silicon season of Silicon Valley? Oh, uh, I think it's going to be really exciting. At first, I was kind of worried, even just for my own character, that TJ's gone and he's a good friend, you know. Um, but it turned out, I think, to be a blessing in disguise. I can maybe talk about my part. I don't want to, you know, step yeah. on anybody else's toes. But for my part, like, it, it, I, I get to end up interacting with more different characters, so kind of expand my character's world a little bit, and uh, I take over a little bit of Ehrlich's role of being like the asshole, more of that. So it's really fun. I, I think you guys are going to be excited to watch it, and there's a lot of current stuff that's happening in the tech world, in the world that you know we also address. That's good. And then, um, well, look, How to American, Jimmy Yang, Get on uh, Amazon or anywhere. It's it's today. Today's the day. What what does this podcast come out today? Steve, when's this podcast gonna come out? Can we get it out in a few days? Yes, yeah, we we want oh, this book to be man. a consistent bestseller, not just the first week. Exactly. Hopefully, yeah. So yeah, by the time this podcast is out, you guys can order it, and uh, it's hopefully I'll be a bestseller by then. Who knows? Well. Excellent. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Jimmy. This Thanks is this is really great. I'm a I'm a huge fan of the show, your character on the show, and now this this book. Thank you, sir. Thanks. And uh, you know, it's funny, TJ Miller once uh stopped by here and was on the stage mm-hmm. and he was wearing a cast. This mm-hmm. was like a I don't know, six months ago, maybe seven months ago. And um he just tells this story. He just came on um, on the fly because he was on a podcast upstairs. Uh-huh. He came on on the fly and he just told this, this story of being in the doctor's office with getting this cast. And he was just so funny just simply relay, relaying that story. And it was yeah. all timing combined with just the slightest bit of punching, punching up the story. Yeah. And so you can see how different uh, characters form in a stand-up persona. Ah, yeah. I mean, he, he's a genius. He just a, He's just naturally funny. He's able to make things funny. And I think when you get to the point, I think Louis C.K. said that. He's like, I can make anything funny. Like, I'm a good stand-up. So I think when you get to that point, it's amazing. But also, you got to find what you really actually want to talk about. Yeah, what do you think you want to talk about? I mean, you've always been talking about it. But... I guess the stuff in the book and, and there's things that are relatable. I, I don't know what I want to talk about in stand-up yet. That's why I'm still just kind of dabbling a little bit. But uh, I got a tour coming up, so we'll, we'll see. All right, well, thanks again. Thanks. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.